no matter where and what stage of life we're in, whether we're in college, whether we're a student, whether we're just starting out our career or we're already retired, God calls us to shepherd and to steward our influence with the people around us for the benefit of the kingdom of God. But we realize that when it comes to stewarding that, a lot of us don't really know who we are, right? And so this, this concept of identity emerged because we realized that even in the middle of trying to shepherd, often we sort of define ourselves by our, uh, our ability to say yes to lots of things or the, the amount of money that we make or the job that we do. And while those things are important aspects maybe of what makes us us, and what we steward, they're really not the truest thing about us. And so as we thought of people who could guide us through the topic of identity, Greg Tonegal was the first to come to mind, partially because he is incredible at discipleship, and partially because he leads a group of people on the basketball team for whom there are clear stats that it's easy to define yourself by. But if you talk to the people on the basketball team, they don't see themselves just as people who are trying to win ball games. They see themselves as people who are trying to be really good disciples in the kingdom of God. And somebody is responsible for that culture. It's the spirit through Greg Tonegal and Jeff Clark. And so, if you will, join me in welcoming our speaker, Coach Greg Tonegal. I was thinking throughout the week as I was preparing for this, as I was kind of processing identity, and I was thinking, am I the only one who feels this pressure and tension to be somebody else? Because as I processed my life, I kind of saw this pattern of, of, of trying to be somebody else. And I kept thinking, am I the only one? Do, do, I, do I walk alone in this fight and this kind of the weightiness of trying to figure out who I am? And I don't necessarily mean when I say trying to be somebody else, is there a specific person in mind? But is there just an alternative version of me that I'm often pressured into trying to become? So I sat with that question for, for this week, and it, it reminded me of a story. So I'm a senior in college, and I um, play basketball, and it's a big game. And uh, I loved big games, and, and when you become a senior, you, you learn to kind of live in these moments. And we're warming up, and the crowd's there earlier because it's a big game. And uh, I look over, and sitting on press row is Larry Bird. And I idolized Larry Bird growing up, and I mean, and I just kind of lost my mind. And I start looking at Larry Bird as I'm warming up, and I don't really realize that I'm no longer focused on the game. And in fact, my teammate pulled me aside. He said, are you okay? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you just missed three layups in a row. You know, I'm like a kid in a candy shop as we're warming up. I'm like looking over. That's, that's Larry Bird. And so I'm not focused at all on the game because I've always wanted to be Larry Bird. I've always looked up to Larry Bird. He was, he was larger than life for me. So long story short, we win the game. And then, as usual, they pull us back into the media room afterwards, and uh, I'm sitting there just thinking about Larry Bird, because if you've been in these for a while, they get kind of boring. The, the media is either trying to like, get you to say something stupid, or they're asking you just regular questions. And all of a sudden, in the back, so this room was very small, is this hand that goes up. And in my mind, I can still envision this hand. It's larger than life. It almost reaches to the ceiling. And I hear my name. And it's almost like the Red Sea parted because everybody moved out of the way because Larry Bird was speaking. And he says, I got a question for Greg. And immediately when he said that, I just lost consciousness and I sat there like this. And he asked me a question. And I don't even remember what he said. And I didn't respond. And my coach there, he hit me and he goes, hey, Greg, Larry Bird just asked you a question. And I thought, Larry Bird just asked me a question. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And he hit me again. He said, do you have an answer? And I, I stumbled through something. I, I don't remember what it was. And I was, I was basically drooling. The, the, the media session ends, and I run back to, to talk to Larry Bird, because I've seen him from afar. I've read about him. I've never met him. And he's got bodyguards around him. And if, if you know Larry Bird, he's, he's a prideful, arrogant man. And I, I get through the bodyguard, and I stick my hand out there, and I say, Mr. Bird, I grew up in Indiana. I've idolized you. I've watched your Celtic games. I saw you guard Michael Jordan. Man. And he says, thank you, and he just walks away. And I, I stand there, like, shaking, like I just shook Larry Bird's hand. Well, I walk out, and waiting for me is this young lady that I had just met a couple months prior. And it's my wife now. She goes, we're late for dinner. And I look at her, and I'm like, oh, she has no idea. I just met Larry Bird. And she goes, listen, you said that we would be there by 730. We got to go. And so this went back and forth for a couple minutes. I was trying to convince her. I said, listen. 
I just met Larry Bird. We can't go anywhere right now. She goes, go shower, meet me outside. And my first thought was, I'm not showering because I'm not wiping Larry Bird's sweat ever from the palm of my hand. So we go back and forth for a while, and basically it was that moment, like I don't know if, if you're married, you had that moment when you knew you were either going to move on from somebody or you're going to marry them. But that was it for me. I said, if I can get over the fact, because as we talked about it, it came, the reality was she didn't know who Larry Bird was. She said, what's the big deal? Who's Larry Bird? And I said, Larry Bird is my idol. Larry Bird is who I want to be. And we, we argued about this back and forth, and it even came up in our marriage counseling when the, the pastor was talking to us. He said, now look, it, when you get married, there's no back door. I said, listen, we've already overcame the greatest tension that our marriage will ever endure. When we first met, she didn't know who Larry Bird was. So I explained to him you know, what that meant to me. Now, I laugh at that story now, but I wonder, do all of us have an image that somebody has laid upon us that has become larger than life, and there's something or somebody that we wanted to be, but the reality is, as we pursued that, it gave us a life that was smaller than we had hoped for. And I think often that's, that's the pursuit of identity for us. I, I, I've kind of titled this, Image Bearers to Image Wearers. And it's this idea that we were created to bear the image of God, but in our culture, We've wore different images from our culture. And as we wear them, we put them on and we take them off because they never quite complete us. They don't bring us to wholeness, so we just try a new image. And what this means is that we are in an identity crisis. We live in a, in a culture today, you guys would, can resonate with this, it's, it's individualism. And so there's this constant pursuit of you've got to pursue yourself in a very individualistic way. So we've got a lot of faith, but it's faith in our own human potential, and we've lost our God-given identity. We've lost this identity that is about bearing the image of God, and it's really about bearing our uniqueness and our potential outside of God. And I think identity is a very difficult concept for us to grasp. No matter if you're young and you're in college or if you're old like me, it's a difficult thing to grasp for a couple of reasons. One, I think a lot of our perspective of faith is this. And I see this with young people, and I see this with my guys. So you're going to hear me talk about my guys a lot. Those, those are the guys I disciple. We've got this idea of faith, so I was saved. So at one point, God stepped into my life, but that is a past event. And then we're told through our own discipleship and, and maybe the church, maybe our family, that someday I will go to heaven. So that's a, like this futuristic version of myself. But then the reality is you and I live here. We live in the in-between. And the reality is we live in the in-between in a sinful, sinful world with sinful people, and we're constantly searching for this identity. We're constantly looking for our true selves. And everybody's telling us there's a better version of us, but yet our experience tells us it really can't be because I'm stuck. And nobody's really given us a faith that says this faith is pertinent for today. This faith will revitalize you today. This faith will give you a new identity for today. We've been given an identity for the past, we've been given one for the future, but the question remains, is there a faith for today? So there's an idea that, yeah, there is a better version of me, but that better version is offered from the world, and it's usually something that's cool, maybe a version of um, success, sexy, affluent, powerful. We have all these versions that the world hands us, but in the end, those things never quite satisfy us. So two things that I hope to accomplish today as we, as we think about identity. One, God would be so kind just to open our eyes and say, okay, here are some of the images that you've adopted from your culture around us. So for me growing up, it was, it was a Larry Bird image. It was an image of a successful athlete. It was an image that I could achieve my identity, right? And I had to go through this process that you, you can't achieve your identity. You receive it, and then you walk into that. But two, as God shows us the images we would find the one true image, that he would begin to open up our eyes. And, and Paul prays this in Ephesians 1, and I love that prayer. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be, in, would be open, so that you would know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of your glorious inheritance, and his immeasurably great power for those who believe. I mean, to me, that speaks to identity. Our eyes would be open. We would have this vision of who he wants us to become. And then the coolest part for me is he says he empowers it. It's not me trying to do it all. It's not me trying to strive. Like, he offers the power to step into this greater version of myself. So I want to begin with the end in mind. In coaching, this is one of the most important concepts that I've learned. So I start the season out, and I say, okay, what does the end look like? When we get to March and we're playing for a national championship, what does this team need to look like? 
you're going to build a house, you'd probably do the same thing. You'd say, okay, if we're going to build this thing, we've got to have an idea of what it looks like down the road. But do we do that with our spiritual lives? Are we able to stop and say, what does the end actually look like for us spiritually? Because the reality is, I think for me growing up, and this is what was expressed to me, whether it's from my family or through a church, was we'd start the story, we'd start the Christian story at Genesis 3, and we'd end at Revelation 20. So we'd start at bad news, and we would finish with even worse news of the judgment. And what this began to elicit in my mind was this was what it meant to be human. It meant I'm flawed, I struggle throughout life, and then someday I'm going to get judged for that flaw. And if that's what it means to be human, if, that would, if that's what it means for our potential, you can imagine why when the world comes by and says, hey, I got an offer, I got an offer for an image that is better than what you got, we're like, well, why wouldn't I take that offer? Because the current vision, the paradigm that I have of the Christian life isn't quite as attractive as what the world's offering me. But I, I think of this, um, if we could only reverse that, if I can get this to work, and instead of starting at Genesis 3, what if we started at Genesis 1? And we've, we've heard this before, this is the Imago Dei, right? God says, let us make man in our image. So God says, I'm going to make man in, in my own image. And, and Andy Crouch says this, and I love this because we talk about greatness all the time in our program. And I love this idea that my job as a coach is to pull greatness out of my athletes. And I'm seeing this with my children now. As I look at my children and I say, I want to pull greatness out. Well, what does that look like? Andy Crouch says, to image God is the unfolding of all the potential in a person in a way that gives glory to God and reflects the fullness of his creation. So inside of us, there's this potential that lies, and if it can unfold and if it can come out, we image God, thus we imitate greatness. So I think the starting point needs to be, what's the greatness inside of us? What's the potential in each and every one of us? So if we begin with greatness, we must end with greatness. So instead of stopping at Revelation 20, if we go to Revelation 21, God recreates. At the beginning, he creates in his image. Obviously, that image is broken. But then God restores it, and he recreates it. And I just think this is a new paradigm for us to begin to view the Christian life and to begin to view our own identity. So I look at it like this. We've been created as image bearers. That image has been broken, yes, but that's not the starting point, and that certainly is not the ending point. And eventually God restores it, and he's an image restorer. So the search for identity, the... The, the way I like to view discipleship now is the restoration of that image. I'm joining God as he restores me and as he restores other people. And a simple way to, re, to, to remember this is recovery is discovery. kind of just hit me yesterday morning as I was praying. As God's image is recovered, my identity is discovered. So it's not looking for another version. It's not looking for a better image. It's not accepting what the world says. It's pursuing Christ. And Steve, if you've been in church on Sunday, I feel like Steve's been saying some of these things throughout his sermons about if you want to know your identity, you need to know Christ. And by knowing Christ, we begin to know ourselves. So as I point my life towards Christ, he points me in a search for my own identity. But the problem is we trade our own God-given identity for disposable images. And our world will offer you a million disposable images. And one of the scary things we were looking at, our staff, there's an organization that did a research, and they said by the year 2050, so you're looking at, what, 30 years from now, 25 million young adults are going to leave the faith. People who had faith or who grew up in a home of faith, who attended a church, in 30 years will leave the faith. And i got to ask why. Because they're living in this time period where, they, where their only recognition is of their fallenness and there's no hope that God is actually going to restore them. They, they can't look out and say, there's a better version of myself and that version is in Christ. So instead they adopt the world's version and then they go, you know what? My faith's not pertinent. I'm going to walk away from it. And that's sad. And I think it's largely because of the perspective that we have. So I want to go to Scripture and I just want to see what can we pull out of Scripture that talks about identity. It's kind of interesting. Um, this spring, we were praying as a staff, and we felt like our team really needed to, to talk about identity. Because um, as, as Ethan said, one of the scariest places for identity, at least for me, is, is in athletics, because athletics offers you identity. 
you can go play a great game and all of a sudden people identify you as successful. Or you can lose a game and you can begin to identify with your failures. And, and it's easy. And you can manipulate that, right? I learned very quickly as a kid, you can manipulate the opinions of others. Just play well and people think highly of you. Um, so we just, as a staff, we said, you know, let's jump into Romans 6. And actually Trent's here. And then we said, what if we memorized Romans 6? What, what could we learn about identity? And I was blown away at just all the references to identity and what Paul has to say. So it's been a couple months, but I'm going to give it my best shot here. And I just want you to listen to the identity language inside of Romans 6. So this is Paul speaking, and he's really speaking about this new identity that we have. And then we'll, we'll kind of anchor in here, and I think there's just three takeaways. But Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We, therefore, were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we, too, can live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we'll also live with him. Or we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. And he continues, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to life? But thanks be to God that though we were once slaves to sin, we have come to obey from the heart the pattern and teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. I'm using an example of everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to sin, so now offer yourselves as slaves to God, which is righteousness leading to holiness. When you're slaves to sin, you are free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at the time of the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But since you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves to righteousness, which leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's three things. As, I, as we read that and as we sat with that, it was probably three months that we just kept reading and praying and memorizing. God, what does this have to do with identity? So there's three things. The first is, Paul talks about Christianity is not in the box. It's in Christ. The second is, for Paul and, and, and for Jesus, death always precedes life. So if we want to find identity, we first have to die. And then the third is, the image we have is that of an I am third life. So I kind of want to backtrack and just, and just work our way through a few of these, but perspective drives identity. So I've talked about many of us have this perspective of the faith. We, we understand what it did for us in the past. It may do something for us in the future, but what does our faith in Christ do for us today? And so perspectives are like compasses. They either draw us to objects or they draw us away from objects. And Paul says, look, your faith is not about being in the box. It's about being in Christ. And I, this, is, this has really helped me understand because I grew up with a box mentality and I grew up in a tradition that really taught the box. So the box is more about religious belonging. Think of it that way. So a lot of us will draw a box and we'll say, I'm in the box. I'm a Christian because I do the do's. There's certain things that I do that I identify that make me a Christian. But I'm also in the box because I don't do the don'ts. So unlike the people across the street, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I'm in the box, therefore those people might not be in the box. So you can see what this does. We begin to wear the image, and we really wear the image of Christian identification through certain man-made religious activities. I'm in the box because this is what I do. I wear the image of somebody who's got it 
all together. As opposed to what we would call the path or the line. So here's the box identity. My Christian identity is about what I do or what I don't do. The result of that is you're either in or out of the box. This is how I used to view myself as a Christian. There were times when I was doing the do, so I was in the box. But then there were times, like most of us go through dry seasons, or maybe we slip up every once in a while. What are we in or out at that period? And we begin to ask the question, am I in, am I out? Is God mad at me? Is he happy with me? Did he kick me out? And what happens is we get a spirit of perfection. So we want to be perfect because perfect gets us in the box, and we begin to strive. And for me, it was heavy striving. It was about working very hard. And if it didn't work or I was slipping out of the box, the only answer I knew was, Try harder. Pray harder. Because after all, I was an athlete. And my coach always told me, practice makes perfect. So I carried that into my faith, and I thought, okay, God, you, you call us to be perfect, then I'm going to pray harder, I'm going to read harder, and I'm going to try harder. But what I found was there's no grace in that. And a faith without grace is not a fun faith at all. It's heavy, and it's worrisome. So I would read Matthew 11, and Jesus would say, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And I'm like, yeah. For those people it is, but not the faith that I carry. Because God, I'm trying, and I'm trying, and I'm yet to be perfect, and I'm not sure if I'm in or out of the box. So you can see the identity that forms over time if you have a box identity. You're an image wearer. You're just wearing religious, man-made, effort religion. This is opposed to, well, let me, let me backtrack. So that was what it did to me personally. I strove and I strove. Now, those things are all good things. Trust me, I love discipline. I love trying harder. I think we cooperate with God in these things. But if there's no grace, there's no empowerment, then it's really all about me and it's not about what God's doing. So then as a leader, God began to give me people. He began to give me young people that I was called to disciple. And I started to put them in the box. And I started to kind of elicit this image that, look, if you're going to be part of our group, you're going to maintain the status of being in the box. And if you can't, you're either not disciplined enough or you're not trying hard enough. And it drove them to try to be perfect. And eventually what I saw was they began to fake it to get in my box. In any organization that is driven by a lack of authenticity or vulnerability will not grow. So we begin to see then this is a, it was a period of time where we were wondering, why aren't we growing? Why aren't we moving forward? And we found out guys were so intimidated because they couldn't maintain their status in the box, they just began to fake it. Yeah, I'm reading the word. Yeah, I'm praying. Yeah, I'm all into this coach. But then they'd go live different lives when they weren't with us anymore because we had kind of created this box mentality. So then this would be opposed to the path. And God's been teaching me about the path. And how do I, how do I line those I disciple on the path? First off, how do I see my own faith as one that's on the path? So the path is about progress, not perfection. It's about recognizing every day God is moving me closer to himself. Am I taking giant leaps? Sometimes. Am I going backwards? Sometimes. But it's when I go backwards that there's opportunities for grace. And when there's opportunities for grace, I become an image bearer. Because when grace shows up, God shows up. And when God shows up, other people look at that and they say, he must be real because you are reflecting him. And we apply this to our basketball all the time. Who are we becoming as a team? Where are we at on the path? You know, last year we went through a three-game losing streak in the middle of the season, and if I had a box mentality like I used to have, I'd have said, it's over, we're done, we're just not in the box as a team. But instead we said, okay, if this is a path, where are we at on the path? Granted, we're not where we want to be this way, but we're there, and where's God moving us today? And you can see how this plays out with identity. The identity becomes, who am I becoming? So as a disciple, I ask God every day, And I look at the trajectory of my life. Who am I becoming? Yes, this may be a tough season. Yes, I have slipped up. But God is somewhere. God is transforming me. And as he's doing that, I am bearing his image to a world. And last year with our team, we we walked in front of our guys at the beginning of the year and we said, guys, I don't care where you're at on the path. Some of you guys don't even come from homes of faith. Some of you guys have been mature Christians all your life. It doesn't really matter. Just be it honest about where you're at and be willing to move forward. And it opened up a year of just explosive growth for us because guys could come to us and say, coach, I've got this addiction. And we didn't say, you're not in the box. We just say, you know what? 
There are a lot of people that have that addiction, and God has fixed them over time, so let's just get to the process of letting God transform you. And as guys were able to come forward with that, like I said, it opened the door for explosive growth. So the path opens up room for God, God's grace, and when God's grace shows up, we can be image bearers. So how do we get out of the box and onto the path? Paul makes it very clear. He says the path is in Christ. If you look at Paul's theology, pick any book. Paul is adamant about it's in Christ, it's in Christ, it's in Christ. In fact, if you go to Philippians 3, Paul says, look, if anybody has reason to talk about being in the box, it's me. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was in the box. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Pharisee. As for persecuting the church, I got the most zeal out there. As for righteousness in the law, dude, I was faultless. And then he says, but for all that box stuff, I consider it worth, worthless for one thing, to be in Christ. So he says, you can brag about being in the box, but the reality is this. Finding your identity is about being in Christ. And obviously Paul knows a little bit about identity from a guy who's went from one extreme to the other. And he says, I finally figured it out. It's about being in Christ. So you can see all these references. This is just in Romans 6 alone. In the first 11 verses, he says, we're baptized into Christ. We're buried with him. We're united in his death and in his resurrection. We're crucified with him. We died with Christ, in Christ. Pick any book that Paul's written, and you constantly see this theme of in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And the reason I highlight that is that becomes the compass for which we use to find our identity. Instead of looking for the disposable images that we wear, we say, God, I can bear his image as I look to him. So one of the results is, you can look at kind of the two juxtaposed. Identity along the path in Christ assures me of my value, my existence, and my security. As opposed to identity in the box constantly reminds me that what I'm doing is not good enough, but to keep trying harder, or rather than try harder, I can just fake my way into the box. So second observation, the first one is we got to get our Christian identity right, and it's got to be in Christ and not in the box. The second observation is death always precedes life in the Bible, and specifically in Romans 6, death precedes life. So the world is always standing, offering us a better life, and the world says, if you just pursue life, you'll actually find more life. So think about how this works. Sorry to use this example, but it's true. We'll go Nike first. Nike's slogan, just do it. And then they put some of the most successful, powerful, wealthy people up in front of us, and they say, hey, whatever you dream, whatever you want, whatever you pursue, if you just do it, you can become like that. You can become like them. Miller Lite had a slogan a couple years ago, probably more than that when I was a kid. They'd show this commercial, everybody was perfect, models, happy, had it all together, and it'd say, everything you've ever wanted, dot, 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 in a beer. And you think, how ridiculous is that? You can have this life, you can have that body, you can have that look, you can have that identity if you just drink this drink. And like, we, we can think about that rationally right now and laugh at it. But as we're watching the football game and it comes on, you start to believe it. Like, yeah, those people got it all together. They got what I want. But that's the world's way of offering us an image. So the world is always going to offer us an image that looks cool, maybe it's sexy, maybe it's successful, and say, this is who you are. This is who you can become. This is the best version of you possible. Think about it. If you want the life that the world offers you, pick up a Forbes magazine and, and the world will say, you can purchase that life. If you want the life the world offers you, pick up a Sports Illustrated and it'll tell you, you can achieve this life. You can pick up a GQ magazine, and it'll say, you can wear the life. You can pick up Men's Health, and it'll tell you over and over, you can have the sex life that's going to lead you to the ultimate fulfillment, and on and on and on down the world. We're, we're just constantly bombarded by images that I'm not even sure we realize how affected we are through our identity. But then you put all that stuff away. You throw the magazines away, and you open up the Word, and Paul says, if you want the life, you first die. It blows my mind that when you go through Romans 6 alone, 
he mentions death 20 times to life 10 times. Two to one ratio, Paul says, die, die in order to live. You have to die, you have to die in order to live. And it's so counterintuitive to what we've been told our entire lives. We don't want to die. We just want to get to the life. But Paul says in order to do that, you first have to die. And really, that's, that's the story of my testimony is, is God taking me to a point of, of, of really identity death is the way I would put it. That same senior year, um, it was another big game we were playing in. And I had actually been injured for about two and a half years. And it was a period that God just kind of produced life inside of me. But first, something had to die. And we were playing Notre Dame at the United Center, and, uh, which is where the Chicago Bulls play. And I'd come off of injury, so I'm out two and a half years. That's a long time. I'd waited for this comeback, and I'd beg God, bring me back, God. And I had this idea in my mind, when God brings me back, he's going to bring me back. And I'm going to be in that media room, and I'm going to tell everybody how awesome my Savior is. So we're in this game, playing Notre Dame. They're number three in the country. We had a guard named Chris Thomas. We're underdogs. We shouldn't have been in the game, but we're down one with 35 seconds to go. Chris Thomas pulls it out, and it's that moment was, he's a smart player. I'm guarding him. He knows what to do. He tells everybody to get out of his way, which is, like, completely disrespectful. But he had all the right to think that, all right? He was in the NBA. Like, Roger's almost better than me at this point of basketball. So I do the only thing that I know to do. Well, I'm not getting embarrassed on national TV. I, I climb up in him just to kind of protect myself. Well, as I do it, I get a piece of the ball. It lays loose, and we both lay out for it. And I get it, and I call a timeout. And I'm running back to the bench. My coach is fired up. And he draws up this play. We had a really good player. It's for our big guy. And then he turns to me and he says, but if they double team him, you're going to be ready for the shot. And it was like, my coach believes in me. I couldn't wait because he, he just shot like a jolt of greatness in me. And as I walked onto the floor, everything in the last two and a half years flashed in front of my face. God, I've been injured for two and a half years. It's for this moment. I'm going to be back. This is what it's about. Walk out, we run the play to perfection. Double team comes. I mean, coach was prophetic. They swing it to me. I'm on the right wing. Two seconds left. I let it fly. We're down one. I had taken this shot 50,000 times in my life in my backyard, and I love the angle. I wouldn't have asked for a better shot, and I watch it ball in the air. It seemed like it was there for about five seconds, just floating, and it goes in. But then it popped out. Worst feeling in the world. I fall on the ground, team runs off, somehow I get dragged off, and I remember being back in the locker room, punching lockers, crying, just going nuts, and I'm angry. You know, God, where were you in this moment? You'd taken me through two and a half years of that. You could have at least delivered in that moment. And then all night, it was on Sports Center. And of course, my buddies don't know how bad I'm hurting. They're texting me from high school, dude, you blew it. What happened? And I'm like, I'm in so much pain, so much pain. Well, the reality is my whole life had kind of built to that moment of identity. I mean, I grew up in the state of Indiana, right? You, you love basketball if you grow up in the state, and I wanted to be a very successful basketball player. And as I said earlier, I figured out I could manipulate the opinions of others if I played basketball. So I would discipline myself. I would train in order to get the approval of others. In fact, I had an opportunity to play in the state finals in high school, the last single class. So if we have some Hoosiers here, there was a time where we had one class, where whether you're a big school or small school, you played in one class. We made it to the state finals that year, and there were 28,000 people at our game, at a high school game, 28,000 people. And I remember walking onto the floor as a 17-year-old kid, and I had faith, and I loved the Lord, but I loved basketball a little bit more, if I'm really honest. And I walked out there, and they were getting ready to let us go, and I was like, I've never seen this many people. I mean, my town had 22,000 people in it. There were 28 at a basketball game. And honestly, I go, they're here to watch me play and to win a state title. And I really had convinced myself they were here to watch me play. Long story, we lose at the buzzer. I play an awful game. And for a year, I'm wandering just mentally going, God, you let me down. Who am I supposed to be? I thought my whole life I was going to be an Indian All-Star, state champion, you know, Mr. Basketball. And so I wander into college with that same mindset. And I love God, and God's calling me to minister to my team, but I also love basketball, and I'm kind of holding on to both. And then comes the moment of death. I think God stepped in and just said, okay, if you truly want to love me, and you truly want an identity, something's going to have to die. I go up for a routine shot in the middle of summer. I'd never been hurt before, and I tear my ACL. Nobody's around me. Nobody's near me. 
And if you know what that is, it, it, it can be a career-ending injury. So I think, okay, I'm going to be back in a year. I'll be back. Year comes by, I'm not back, I have another surgery. Another year goes by, I have two more surgeries. All in all, I end up having four surgeries, and things aren't going the way they're supposed to be going. But during that time, during that death period, God's so faithful to bring some amazing men into my life. In fact, he brought one pastor in my life who just showed up one morning at a restaurant. He goes, hey, you're the basketball player, right? I said, yeah. He goes, I've heard you're, you love the Lord. And I said, I do. He said, you'll meet me at 5 a.m. for the next two months at my church. And, you know, I mean, you're a college person, right? 5 a.m., you might as well just stay up all night. I'm like, what? He didn't give me an option. I show up thinking, what is this weirdo going to do? He puts on worship music, and he says, we're just going to worship. And I hadn't had a picture at that time of what a man, how a man worships. This guy laid his heart out before the Lord. This guy was dancing. This guy would come pray with me. And slowly he began to show me, what does it mean to worship? And what does it mean to fully submit yourself to God? And so it was during this time, my identity began to be reformed. No longer was it in worshiping basketball, but it was, it was worshiping God. And it was, it was a vineyard church, like crazy, kind of charismatic. I'm not sure we always had our theology right. But we loved God. We loved other people. And it formed me during that period of who I would eventually become. So I fast forward. Twelve years later, I didn't want to go into coaching at that time. I hated basketball during that period. I, I was looking for anything but coaching. And nobody had ever showed me that maybe basketball could be a ministry. They were two separate things. So in my mind, I'm either going to go into ministry or I'm either going to go into basketball. And then God began to kind of intersect the two. I end up a coach, and I end up in the national championship game in 2014. And I walk out, and I'm thinking, the default was, man, this is my moment. And God caught it in an instant. And God said, no, 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 this is your moment to worship. And I, I remember this plain as day. I mean, this game's on ESPN2. It's a pretty big deal for us. I just start crying because God flashes me back for two and a half years of that time of, of, of death where I just began to worship. So I begin to pray, God, would you just allow this game to be a game of worship? Would you just allow me to just enter into a whole different perspective? Because in the end of this, whether I win this national championship or not, it doesn't offer me anything. It's actually worthless. And I, I, I can't explain it. I wish I could. For the next two hours, it's like I went to another world. I sat on that bench kind of laughing, having fun. I mean, I coached my heart out. But I was like, God took me to this place I'd never been before. And I didn't even think about winning or losing. Normally, you talk to coaches, they get in that situation, they're like sick to my stomach because you think you've got one opportunity in that big stage, in that big moment. But I just released it to God. I said, you can have it all. And it's actually happened three times total, two more times as we got on that big stage. You know, the default, the flesh says, hey, this is that moment. And God says, no, this, this is your moment to worship. And... To me, that's the ultimate expression of identity. When I'm so close and being in Christ that all I do is express and reflect his goodness to other people. N.T. Wright said it this way as I was looking at some stuff. It really helped me because we've, we've heard about the image of God and, you know, that can be a very abstract concept. You know, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Do I look like God? You know, is he tall? Does he have big feet? Does he smile? He says, you know, some of that, you know, may be true, but, but the reality is this. Think of it as an angled mirror. So as God looks down through us, he reflects to other people. He doesn't just reflect to us. We don't just, it's not a regular mirror where you look in, you get the exact reflection back, but it's an angled mirror, and he uses us as that angle, and as he reflects outwardly to us, we reflect the goodness, the love, the mercy, the justice of God to other people. And as we do that, people look back, and that mirror's still angled. It points right back up to God, and they go, man, who is this God? And that's when we become image bearers. We're no longer wearing the image of God. We're reflecting the image of God. And I thought about it this week. I, I got to go from here into a coach's clinic up in uh, East Noble High School. The place is going to be filled with coaches who are worshiping the game of basketball, who have come because basketball is going to offer them identity. And my prayer wasn't, God, give me a cool little drill I get to share with these guys because I'm going to teach basketball. But I said, how can I be that angled beer? When I walk in that gym... Maybe you in some way would allow me to reflect who you are. Then through relationship and through time with these coaches, they would look at our program and they would say, we'd like to know the creator of that program. That's what it means to bear the image of God. And that's what we hope our program becomes is in our own world, is that we can bear the image of God to basketball coaches. And there's a ton of people here that do that. 
Trent is a guy that's doing it in the business world. God reflects down through a business out to the business people and says, this is who I am. And then people look at that business and they go, man, who is this God that you serve? Roger and my other buddy that came today, he's doing it in the school system. He's taking his vocation and said, I'll be an angled mirror. I'm going to allow God to reflect to this culture what it means to love maybe those on the margins. And then those on the margins look back and they say, well, wow, what you're doing makes me want to know this God more. Imagine if we all adopted that identity for our vocations and for our whatever disciplines, whatever we're good at doing. So, let me just explain what I think needs to die. Me. All right? It's pretty simple. The trajectory of the fall is always pushing us inward. Somebody said this. I read it in one of my classes. You know, the, the hellbound aren't traveling outward, they're traveling inward, right? The more we focus on me, the more we think life is about me, the more I, I, I think, what do I need? The more death I bring to myself. So the reality is, and we all know this, you can't be filled with yourself and the Holy Spirit at the same time. So if we can die to ourselves, we'll bring life to those around us. And most of us, I, I like to look at it this way, just to give us an image. If we look at our lives, we could kind of separate. We're surrounded by people, we're surrounded by power, and we've all got possessions. Now, if you're in college, you may think you have no possessions now, but you got something, all right? The reality is, if me is at the center of my life, I'm receiving from these things. It's just the natural byproduct of putting me in the center. So I take from people, I receive power from other people or things, and my possessions are mine. I hoard onto them. I try to control them. Call that the me first life. The opposite of that would be the I am third life. And Paul says this throughout Romans. Verse 10 says, the life he lives, he lives to God. So we have the perfect image bearer. We don't have to make this image up. We don't have to conjure up. What does it mean to be an image bearer? We can look to Jesus and find the one who is the perfect image bearer. So it's really about getting God the center and the primary pursuit of your life. So we, for us, we talk about, you know, it's an I am third life. It's God first, it's other people second. And naturally, when you put God first, when you center your heart on him, here's what happens. You live outward. So instead of always looking at people of what can they do for me or what do they offer me, you just say, man, how can I give them something? How can I use my life as a tool to offer them something? power again. It's not a zero-sum game. When I give away power, I don't lose it. Somebody actually gains it. It's, it's a crazy paradox of Scripture. just another one of those paradoxes. When I give away power, they get power, but I don't lose power, according to Kennedy. Because think about it. Jesus hung on a cross and gave away all the power that anybody could possibly give. And then he created so much power by doing that. Power to overcome sin, power to overcome debts, power to overcome bitterness, Anger, I mean, you name it. He created more power, and that's the example for us. So image bearing, I think, comes down to this. Paul says in Ephesians 3, he says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's people to grasp how long and wide and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love which surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with the full measure of God. So if we love, then we're filled with the full measure of God. And what is the full measure of God? That's that image-bearing capacity. So I'm not the smartest person in the world. It took me months to try to figure this out. But it's pretty simple. When we love, when we love God with all of our heart, we're filled with him. Therefore, we bear his image. And no longer do we look at the world and we want that image because we, we don't want to wear it, we bear it. So the image for me is, has just been the cross. I just, the last couple of weeks, I've just been saying, God, give me a picture of, of the cross. Because if I have that picture, I no longer want the Larry Birds of the world. I no longer want the GQ magazine, the Forbes magazine. So think about the picture of the cross. The Bible says the night before Jesus was to go to, to his death, he was sweating blood. 
And that's not a figure of speech. That's not made up. He literally had drops of blood because he was filled with fear and anxious, anxiousness because he knew what was coming, but yet he stayed the course. Why? He loved the Father so much, and he loved us so much. So when I'm facing difficult things, I think about him sweating blood. And if he could overcome that, surely I can overcome that. I think about his road to the cross. If you think about what happens in a Roman beating in the, in the first century, it's beyond appalling. They would take the, the whip, and it had leather strips, and at the end of the leather strip was a metal ball. So the metal ball produced deep contusions. And then on that metal ball, there were bone. And they said they would beat the person, often to death, or until their back would rip open. So as Jesus is being beat, he's God. He could have gave up at that moment. But he says, I love God, I love the Father, and I love other people so greatly, I'm going to continue this. Blows my mind. They place a thorn on his head. I mean, it's massive, and they shove it into his head. He still doesn't quit. Then he gets to the cross, and he's carrying that, that vertical beam, and the, the horizontal beam's already up. And they say when they nail, you know, we've got this idea that they've nailed his hands, and what medical personnel have told us, if you nail somebody through their hands, it'll just rip and they'll fall down. So the nail actually goes through the wrist. Well, if you've taken a medical class, you know there's a, there's a, a median nerve that runs through here, one of your main nerves. And the pain was so great when they went through the nerve they had to come up with a new word to describe that pain. It's called excruciating, which actually means out of the cross. So think about it. The pain is so great, they say, we can't even describe it, so then they call it out of the cross. And they nail him there, and the same thing happens in your feet. And all the while he's hanging there, what does he say? I love God so much, and I love these people so much. Forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. And I'm thinking, that's the image that I want imprinted on my head when I go out into the world people do me wrong, or I think I'm owed something, or maybe I don't win the big game. I want that image. I want the image of Jesus expressing his love in such a way that that's the only image I look to. So Paul lays it out there for us. He says, look, my prayer is that you will be established in that love so you can be filled with that God. So as we're on this path of identity, if we just pursue Christ, we will pursue our true selves. That's the crazy thing about it. By pursuing him, we're actually pursuing our true selves. So here, here's a challenge I got for you. I'm a coach. I got to give you something to do when you leave this place. And we're going to talk. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to talk about um, some of these things. But, but, but the challenge would be this. And this would be to, to get away from the world's images and allow this image to be imprinted on your head. But for two weeks, for two weeks, lay down some of the images that you may be absorbing. For some of us, that's social media. It offers us this, this online image that we can create, and it's constantly distorting the true self. For some of us, it's magazines, it's games, it's videos, whatever it is. For two weeks, can we just let go of those images, and can we pursue the one true image? So for two weeks, you just live inside Romans 6, and you live inside Ephesians 3, and you just allow that image to become the image at which you are pursuing. During my... Uh, period. I ended up getting a tattoo. I'm not promoting tattoos by any means, but it's Galatians 2.20, and it was a reminder to me that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by the Son of God, by the faith. The life I live, I live in faith to the Son of God, and it's just a reminder to me, this, this is what happened. This is who I am. That's my identity. I've been crucified with Christ, and I would even encourage you, take a Sharpie for these two weeks. They say if you're an average shower person, you take average showers, it'll last two weeks. If you're my boys, it'll last two years because I can't get them to take showers ever. S write that somewhere. What is it, what's the image that for two weeks you can just kind of defunct from the world and pursue the image of God? And see what God begins to do, how he begins to open your eyes to a new identity and to a new image.